Before we look at Genesis chapter 25, I have some church bulletins. Thank God for the church ladies with typewriters. These sentences actually appeared in church bulletins or were announced at church services. Here's one. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husband. <laughs> <laughs> Scouts have are saving aluminum cans, bottles and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. <laughs> More next week. Genesis chapter 25, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Median, Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashram, Latushim, and Lamumah. And the sons of Median were Ephah, Epher, Hanak, Abadah, and Eladah. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass, after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Larah. So, if you remember last week, uh, following Isaac's marriage, Scripture says nothing anymore of the activities of Abraham, even though Abraham lived another 35 years. And God promised that Abraham would be exceedingly numerous and the father of a multitude of nations. And this genealogy we just read reveals how this was brought about. We have to, when it talks about Abraham breathing his last at 175, the very day, year, hour, place, and even manner of death is God's lovingly decreed providence from all eternity for his people. Have you ever looked at death that way? Now I have an excuse to read one of my favorite verses in the scriptures. Exodus chapter, uh, Acts chapter 17 24 through 26. It says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So your death, God knows the day you're going to die, just like he knew the day Abraham was going to die. And it's as lovingly decreed in all of eternity, as we call this providence. And what does it say in Psalm 116, verse 15? I use this at uh, funerals. Psalm 116, verse 15 here. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, Abraham's death and burial are framed on both sides of these genealogies. 
before his death are listed the sons of Keturah, and after his death, the six sons of Ishmael. And so it's one thing to live a long life, but it's another thing to live a life that is also a happy life. And Abraham not only dies at 175, but it says in verse 8 that his mind is filled with inner peace and joy. It says, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. But notice the expression gathered to his kin. It's distinguished from death and burial. And this illustrates, gives, should give us confidence of the reunion of the deceased with their ancestors. See, notice how it's written here. A person breathes their last, dies, then is gathered to their kin, and then is buried. So dying precedes being gathered to one's kin, and being gathered to one's kin precedes burial. So it's in between breathing your last and actually having a burial that you're in the presence of your loved ones, or in the presence. This is what the Israelites always believe, that there is death there is life after death, not soul sleep or anything like that, and the grammar proves it here. And when we say uh, to our loved ones, you know, there's, a, there's orphans that are not going to have uh, families when they die, right? Or there might be people in your family that aren't in heaven. Maybe it's you're the, especially in Muslim countries or countries like this, maybe you're the only one that was saved. But beloved, not only will you meet your uh, family, on earth and heaven, but your whole body of Christ is your family. And that's going to be magnified the day you die. Median, I noticed in this uh, uh, genealogy, is a familiar name if you, if you read the Bible. The Medianites were the traders who transported Joseph to Egypt, and Moses actually married into the family of the priest of Median, Jethro. So they're all through the Bible. However, they were in collusion with the Moabites in the disaster of Baal Peor in Numbers 31. And that's when Moses uh, declares a war of extermination against Midian. And this continued throughout the book of Judges. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up because these genealogies, and yet, yeah, they get long and boring, especially when you read all the notes. It's like they have the most notes in certain study Bibles and certain commentaries with the genealogy, and it's like, oh. And, but, the re but the point is, they're making a fact that these are actual cities, that these are actual people that live. Because we have false religion today that they can't prove any of these cities that ever existed in their Bible. But this is one point, is that these were real people and these were real cities. Look at verses 12 through 18. It says, Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kedar, Adbil, Mepsam, Mishma, Duma, Massah, Hadar, Tima, Jeter, Nephish, and Kedamar. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were the names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princesses according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. And the reason they put these 18 verses in before you get to Jacob and Esau is because since Isaac is to be the sole heir of the covenant, it's important for Moses, who wrote this, to indicate that all other heirs have been cared for and have received their due. And that's what you call general providence of God, general blessings of God. Every, I wish I would have looked it up, but I forgot. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus says, uh, uh, be kind to the ungrateful and to the evil, just as your father is. Because why? Because he explains, because he gives rain and sunshine and food to everybody on earth. 
And so everybody on earth is a recipient of God's general blessing. When you become a born-again Christian, you're a recipient of a special blessing, special revelation. But everybody on earth, there will be no excuse when they die because they were the recipients of God's general blessing, which leads to the fact that if you end up in hell, you're not going to have any blessing whatsoever. You're not going to have the sun. You're not going to have food. Then you're going to really know what it's like without the blessing of God. But you know what? Growing old is not a downhill path, but it's an ascent. Look at it that way. What a gift to embrace our mortality and to understand that we have an allotted number of days. As Christians, we know that. I wish I would have known that when I was 20 or 25. I wish, but I can't go back. That's the, the point. But you know what? I wish I would have known what I know now at the age of 20 or 25. Imagine coming to Christ at an early age and knowing what we're talking about now and having your whole life in front of you to glorify Christ. But, you know, God calls us at different times in our life. But look at like Psalm 139, verse 16. And I'll get this thing going sooner or later to put the scriptures up here. It says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, the overwritten, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. That's one of my favorite psalms of scripture. Go to Psalm, you just write these down. Psalm 90, 12. Psalm 90, 12. It says, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Go to Psalm 39, 4. Psalm 39, 4. It says, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. And that's the, when we, when we come into faith in Jesus Christ, we, he, God gives us wisdom to understand that one day we're going to leave this <coughs> earth and be with him. And to number our days and, and to glorify, every chance you get to glorify Christ in your heart, that's where it starts, in your heart, with, which will translate into actions. But look at verses 19 through 26. It says, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, his wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padam, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in the womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out in his hand. And his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So here we go with Jacob and Esau. Uh, you know, back in verse 19 and 20, it says, This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So remember when Rebekah met Isaac and, and, and heard the divine promise of offspring? She fully expected soon to be pregnant. Right? Remember? Remember? But it didn't happen. Now we've, we've gone 20 some odd years, or I guess 35 years, 35 years, and, and Rebekah is still barren. It says here, 20 years have passed, and Isaac's almost 60. And so Rebecca is still barren. And Rebecca was God's chosen bride for Isaac. 
At least that was what the thought was back then. But what is God doing? God was teaching his people that the promised blessing cannot be accomplished through human effort. It's all about grace. Everything's about grace. But look at verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Like Sarah, you know, the, the, Rebekah was barren. And only divine intervention could change that. So what did Isaac do? He prayed for her, and Rebekah conceived. You know, it's, it, I, I've read this several times before. Isaac is only given like two or three chapters, and because and, and, it goes from Abraham then to Jacob. And it's like Isaac's life is uneventful compared to the bookends that there are. But actually, the more I study this, Isaac, what did he do when Rebekah couldn't conceive? He wasn't like his father who went into the Hagar. He prayed. He prayed. And, 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 and that's what's important, because here you go, Mary Jo. Because back in chapter 24, last week when we looked at it, God sends Abraham's servant, and, and Abraham's servant wanted to honor God. So what did he do? He made a test. And every test that the servant placed before God in order to make sure that this was the right girl he brought home was the right one, everything he laid out there turned up positive. Lord, uh, it, 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 show me the one you've chosen for Isaac. If she comes and I ask her for water, uh, and then she gives the camels a drink, let this be the one. But not only did it stop there, but it was another thing. Lord, uh, uh, if she does this, is she the one? But notice, when you go back to chapter 24, and still after fulfilling all these positive results, it still the servant still wondered if this was God's choice. And, and at that point, they were right. There was no further room for doubt. But now everything here is called into question. Can a sterile, sterile woman actually be the one who is divinely selected to carry out the promised land? No matter what God he placed before no. God when he went to prayer, no. everything turned up positive. Yes, the Lord is speaking to you. Yes, the Lord is saying, this is the one I've chosen. But now, 20 years later, she isn't conceiving. Maybe I heard the Lord wrong. No, you didn't. And, and Isaac did the right thing. Isaac went to the Lord and said, why isn't my wife conceiving? Had he maybe misread something? Maybe he didn't hear God the right way? You know, when that happens, it's happened to all of us at some point. And that's a good thing when that happens. When you're praying for someone, everything falls into place, and you think this has got to be of God. Beloved, it is of God. But what happens is, and the Lord does this. He does this in order to strengthen our faith and to keep that relationship going. Isaac did the right thing by going back to prayer and saying, Lord, is she really the one? What is going on here? Because what would happen if he did? What would happen if you just said, well, this isn't turning out the way I thought it would be, or I have doubts now, and then you start calling your friends, then you start analyzing everything, instead of going to God first. Did I hear you correctly, Lord? That's precious in the Lord's sight. That's true faith. Lord, am I hearing this right? That's what he wants. It's wonderful. To Isaac's credit, I mentioned before, he didn't resort to a surrogate wife like Abraham. Rather, he engaged, he engaged in passionate prayer, and probably for years, probably for years. So I think Isaac gets a, a bad rap. If anything, he's in between these two, Abraham and Isaac or a Jacob, and, but he's the man of prayer. In verse 22, when it says, But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And Rebecca sometimes gets the wrong uh, pen, ink, or something, whatever. But what did Rebecca do? Rebecca went to the Lord in prayer. And that Hebrew is graphically saying, uh, they crushed one another. They thrust one another inside the mother's womb. The children smashed themselves in her, is how the reading is. And in her dismay, Rebecca says something like, why did I even yearn and pray to get pregnant? This can't be it. What is going on here? 
But, and you know what? When the Lord answers our prayers in the way that he does and the timing that he does and confirms, you know, it's always, it, it, it's the Lord's always behind it. And sometimes it's definitely not the way we envisioned it. But God gives her an answer. But I'm just telling you that, that Rebecca did the right thing by going to the Lord. We do the right thing when we have doubts by going to the Lord. I just can't emphasize how precious that is in God's sight. Did I hear you correctly, Lord? That's faith. It's like, I keep saying Debbie, but it's like Debbie. When she loses her keys, what does she do? I say, Lord, help me find my keys. That's precious in God's sight. That's faith. So, when, you know, but this, once again, she's having trouble giving birth. And what does the Word of God say about being born again? Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's about, it's like a natural birth, but it's a supernatural birth type thing. He's always referring to a birth. And being born again is experienced differently by people. That's the principle I get out of this. Some people come to faith in a quiet way as they repent of their sins and receive Christ. Others, God has to keep giving them in hard circumstances, coming to the end of themselves until they come to faith. Others, some births, some spiritual births, are easy from our perspective. Others are hard. Others struggle with it for years until they come to faith. So every, every born-again experience is different. But in verse 23 and 24, it says... And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. So God answers Rebekah, answers her. And, and God tells her that two peoples, or two nations, are in your womb, and that these boys are designated as ancestors uh, of these peoples, Edomites and, and Israel. And then he says, but the younger, the older will serve the younger. And that, that's all through Genesis. It's all through Genesis that the younger will be over the older. And it's never that way in, in, in uh, that ancient time. The firstborn is the one that got all the benefits. But God's always turning things upside down. And why is he doing that? To show that it's all divine intervention everything is. That nobody deserves mercy or grace. Nobody does. By God even showering his blessings on the unsaved is grace, is mercy. Rebecca learns that, you know, that what's happening in her womb is part of the divine plan. And that God is working out his own purposes and, and for his glory and for her good. I mean, 25 and 26 it says, and the first came out red. He was like a Hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the Lord's sovereign grace will not never bow to the order of nature or human expectations. You know, uh, his merciful election is a fact, whether we understand it or not. And, and it, it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that's happening here, because now we get into Jacob and Esau. And sometimes when we just pass over and we know who Jacob ended up being, and we think of Esau as this rugged individual who wanted nothing to do with spiritual things, I'm telling you, the more I study this, Esau is worse off than, I mean, Jacob is worse character than Esau. Because look at verses 27 through 34. It says, So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name is called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. 
And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So verse 27 describes Esau as loving the outdoors. He liked to hunt, and his pursuits made him strong and physically confident. And that's what I'm saying, beloved. So when the Lord breaks somebody down, for them to come into the kingdom, he has to break that confidence that they have that's a confidence outside of and confidence in him. But Jacob, back in verse 27, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Don't let dwell a mild man fool you with Jacob. Because what that's saying is that he was self-contained. He was conventional, and he was controlled. He had his emotions in control, where Esau is driven by his emotions. And this level-headed quality that we see with, with Jacob uh, uh, made him possibly dependable at times, but also that you could count on Jacob. He's a mild-mannered man. He always thinks things out before he acts, but he was also this, this describing him as as a cool opponent who is analyzing things inside of how he can get the best of a person. See, there are those, and nobody uh, 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 deserves salvation. Nobody. You can, you can go to a person that you meet outside, and, and you don't really know that person. I think Selby was talking about that in, in Bible study. You don't really, you, you only know a person what they let you know of them. Whoa. But you know, Somebody can be really uh, uh, appeal to your senses, you know, and, 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 well, he never really talks much, he doesn't really gossip, but you don't know what's going on inside of his heart. He's con 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 contriving and everything else inside of his heart, seeing how he can manipulate people. Whereas the other person's brash and ill-mannered, and you think, oh, that guy's going to hell no matter what. And so we just don't know a person because it's about the person's heart. Because Jacob's a deceiver, and he's our brother in Christ. In verse 28, it says, And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, I used to always look at this verse and blame both parents as showing favoritism, but now I'm starting to have a different thought on Rebekah, and I'll tell you why. Maybe mothers can confirm or deny what I'm about to say. Which is, we see the effects. You always... Any commentary you read on this is always going to talk about parental favoritism and how it, it does pretend it has potential problems if you start favoring one child over another. But you know, the more I read it, it says that Abraham was more showed favor more to Esau because he liked Esau's hunting capabilities and the rugged man that he was. Possibly, Rachel didn't really show favoritism until the, the husband started to, to Esau, so she kind of made it up by showing favoritism to Jacob. Maybe, maybe not. But Esau was a shallow man, and he was governed by his feelings. You could say that Esau is the type of person that says, hey, you can only go through life once, so you need to grab all the guster that you can. That's Esau. Jacob on the other hand, was cool and calculating. He was, a, he was an opportunist. He's a cheater. He was ambitious. He was self-seeking, self-serving, scheming, and heartless. Nobody deserves salvation, Lord. Nobody. Nobody deserves salvation from the Lord. It's all divine grace. Jacob, once again, was a cheater. We're going to find out. He was ambitious. He was self-seeking self-serving, scheming, and heartless. That's the founder of Israel. <laughs> and we could put our, each one of our names in that position is what I'm saying. Verse 29, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. So Esau comes home famished. He's hungry. He's been out all day hunting. 
And, and so this, this hunger and exhaustion, what does Jacob do? He's cool and calculating this. He, he realizes it's making Esau vulnerable to his manipulation. So he takes a chance. Oh, my brother's come in, he's weary, he's famished. Now I can take advantage of him. That's Esau, that's Jacob. In verse 30, when it says, And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. And the only the reason I stop at verse 30 is because that word in Hebrew is it's only used to, it's the only time it's used for feeding a human is, this is the only time. All the other times it's used in Hebrew is about how animals eat. And so this phrase is used for feeding animals, which gives us a unique picture into Esau's manners. He didn't have any. He just gobbled it down like an animal is what it's showing. But in verse 31 it says, But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. So once again, Jacob is exploiting his brother's misery. Even though he believed in the promise, he just didn't believe God's promise could be apart from his own sinful manipulation of Esau. And sometimes each one of us falls into that. We know what God has said. Rebecca, believe me, reminded Jacob throughout his whole life that the older shall serve the younger. You're going to be the firstborn, Jacob. You're going to have the spiritual blessings. But Jacob thought, well, maybe I'm going to help God. So maybe I'll manipulate it and, 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 and get the birthright from Esau. I won't wait on God to give me the birthright. The only thing I can say for us is salvation. I trust in Christ alone for salvation. But then we start adding some good works in there to make sure we're, not to make sure we're saved, but to add to, 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 uh, to save ourselves. I don't know how to say it. When you're born again, you, 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 the fruit bar, bears witness that you've been born again if you do good work. It's not the result, but sometimes we have to help God out. And, and so we don't truly trust God all the way for salvation. We think that we, somehow we have to add some good works here and there. In verse 32 and 33, it says, And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. There is nothing wrong with Esau asking for food. But where Esau erred was that he said, What good is this birthright to me if I die? And, and so in Hebrews 12, 6, they speak of this. In Hebrews 12, 6, it says, 12, 16, I'm sorry. 12, 16 says, Let there, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who from one morsel of food sold his birthright. And we don't, it, it never talks about Esau committing sexual immorality. I'm sure he did, but they didn't give any examples. So, it, it, so we have to think that he's, he's uh, called, described as immoral and a fornicator because he didn't want anything to do with spiritual benefits. He could care less about the spiritual realm. Many people are like that today. Many people live for this life alone. They could care less about the spiritual realm. And, and they allow their sinful nature to, nature to guide to guide them through this life. And they renounce the reality of heaven. I'll, I'll, I've heard people say this to me before. I'll, I'll accept Christ right before I die. I'm going to live for life right now for all the gusto I can. And that's, it, you're governed by your sinful nature. You want to live for this world only. You don't care about spiritual things. And that's why I say, when you sit there and say, Lord, did I hear you right? Or Lord, help me find my keys. Or anything like that, that's precious in God's sight because it's Christ that you hold up. But there are so many people that have no spiritual capacity. They, they think spiritual things are boring. Coming to church is boring. I don't want to need to do any of this. I'm going to live for this life now. That's Esau. But here's the scary part in the last verse 34. It says, And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So these five Hebrew words 
is describing, it's illustrating the, the, the solemn, quiet atmosphere in which Esau silently devours his meal, then leaves. So just picture Jacob is sitting there across the table as he sells his birthright to him. And then Esau eats quietly and then leaves. And I, I am convinced that Esau knew what he was doing. And what I mean by that, but he loved his sin more than spiritual things. And that's the problem with the whole human race. We know we're going to be held accountable on the day of judgment. People know that. They know they have to answer to God. But because it's not, no one's forcing anybody not to come to Christ. Nobody does. God definitely doesn't. But because we love our sin so much, we will not come to Christ. That's the problem. You have the you 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 have you don't have the desire to come to Christ. That's the problem with the whole human race, because they love their sin more. And what I'm saying about Esau is that Esau, when, and you can put the unsaved in the same category, when they die and they end up in hell, they're not going to be repentful. They're going to hate God even more. You see, this is why people are God's enemies when they're not in the faith, because they love their sin more than coming to Christ. And that's what God has to deal with. I end up by saying in Genesis it refers to a misplaced sense of values. It illustrates, Esau illustrates putting the needs of the immediate moment ahead of any other consideration or to put feeling ahead of conscience. Let me finish with this. I talked to my daughter yesterday on the phone for who knows how long, well over an hour. <laughs> and we were talking and he kind of fits in with this, that we love our sin more than God. His people were born sinners. Okay, we're born sinners. And our genes are messed up. They are. You've heard people saying we can't help being that way. No, well, you know, our genes are messed up. So I, we all have vices that we have to struggle with. Some people struggle in the sexual realm with weird vices. Some people struggle. One person can drink... Uh, a six pack and nothing happens to them. Another person gets addicted to it because they're 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 because sin has messed us up. So what happens is when we become born again, God changes us from the inside out, and He changes us. But some desires He doesn't fully take away for His own purpose and for His own glory. He might say, "You have this weird sexual desire," but God calls it an abomination. And then you become born again, and that desire isn't fully taken out of the way because God wants you to struggle with it. Why? Because he wants you to go by the word of God more than your feelings. And one day he will take that desire out. If, if you love the world and you love to drink, mm -hmm. and God hasn't taken that full desire out, but you know that drunkenness is a sin, if you're born again, you're going <coughs> to not drink, because you know it's against God. 